Test, test, can we? Yeah. My is working. Oh, wait, yeah, my sound is on. Uh, is everyone able to hear me? I'm just testing my audio. Sorry for the technical delays. Am I coming through? Can anyone hear me? We can hear you just fine. Macro, did you want to take questions during your presentation or after? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think... Um, Save them for after, yeah, if that's all right. Okay, if everybody can mute their mics. Oh, okay. sorry, I'm just seeing all the chat messages that they can't hear. Okay, great, thank you. I'll turn my Everybody, sorry for the technical difficulties, but this is Tony's first time in Second Life. So, um, this is welcome to the first Vertex special talk on astronomy. Hopefully, there'll be more of them. And this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce my junior colleague, Tony Rodriguez. Tony is a rising third-year grad student at Caltech, and he works on a number of exciting projects in stellar astrophysics. He's also very active in our public outreach program, which, by the way, is excellent, and it's excellent because it's run by students and postdocs and not by professors. And Tony gave a lecture, like the one you're about to hear, and since no good deed ever goes unpunished, I asked him to give a talk in Metaverse, which will be his first. So please mute yourselves. Um, we will save the questions to the end and please type them in in the local chat and then I'll tell them in order uh, received. So without further ado, um, Tony, it's all yours. Okay, thank you so much, George. Um, yeah, please let me know if my audio stops working at any point or if uh, there's any technical difficulties. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I gave this talk in person on August 5th um, to an audience here in the uh, Caltech Auditorium, but now I'm at a much nicer looking Caltech Amphitheater. So uh, thanks for having me here today. Okay, so um, it might be, I don't know if you can do a show of hands here, I was relying a lot on that in the, uh, yeah, so if you can do on the chat, actually, that's probably a good good way to do a show of hands. But let's begin with, um, how many of you can uh, recognize that image that I have on the first slide? So you should just be able to read it off there. So just put it in the local chat, just say yes, me, you know, whatever acknowledgement. Okay, I see a couple. I've seen four coming in so far, and I see maybe 15 people in the audience. So that's not, okay, that's not that many. Well, that's good. Um, so I'll be able to explain sort of what that is and why it came out um, amongst a couple of other pictures that you might have seen in the, in the news. I don't see this thing.
Okay, sorry, I was just sorting a couple issues out that I couldn't uh, change my perspective, so now I'm facing facing the audience correctly. Yeah, so some of you might have seen this maybe a couple weeks ago on, on Twitter, the news, or you know, some whatever your favorite news outlet is, but it's, uh, it's not the nearest start of the sun, as seen by James Webb. I think that was always being posted. And actually, if you, if you look at it and you think that the nearest start of the sun is what's known as an M dwarf, and those are amongst the, the most abundant stars in the galaxy. And those are very red stars, actually. They're a lot redder than our sun. So at first glance, you know, you might look at it and say, wow, you know, that kind of makes sense. Or it's redder, it's, you know, it's an M dwarf, it's you know, by the sun. Fine, yeah, that, that looks right. Um, and what actually is happening in these stars, um, it happens in our sun too, but our sun, its outermost layers, if you boil water, you'll see these big bubbles of convection rise up. Can any of you post in the chat if, if that, you know, that sounds familiar. Whenever you're boiling water, you see like big bubbles come up. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so the outermost layer of the sun does that. But in these low mass stars, uh, the entire star does it. So, you know, looking at those different shades, I see, you know what, that kind of looks like, like it could be an M dwarf, like a fully convective thing. I'm seeing the convective cell. I, I shouldn't be defending this and it's not, it's not the real image. Um, so, uh, yeah, don't, don't be fooled by this. Okay. So something that, that you might want to just take away from this, from this, uh, talk of anything at all is really this two sentence summary is it's, um, the JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope is the world's newest and largest space-based telescope. It's in space. It's two main goals are to study exoplanets. Those are planets outside of our solar system that but other stars, as well as the most distant galaxies in our universe. Um, by most distant, we also mean the oldest, so the ones closest to the formation of the universe, closest to the Big Bang. Um, this telescope will accomplish many, many other science goals, but these are really the two main purposes for which it was built and um, that it will specialize in. It uses optical and infrared light, so I'll talk a little bit more about why that choice was done and how to make sense of that choice, especially well, one of the big questions that has come up is, are we seeing false color images? So that, that I'll answer in some upcoming slides and hopefully clarify it for, for some of you who've seen that term in the news, not sure exactly if you can trust the images or, you know, things like that. Okay. So a little bit more, more fun images that I'm just going to show. How many of you have seen this? You know, post something in the chat. This is, this is kind of nicer actually than the uh, in-person one, because here you can post the questions or the answers to these questions. So what, what stands out in this image? What's something that you think you see stands out in particular? Just feel free to post it away. Yeah, yeah the color, that's right, that's something. Gaseous cloud, yeah, yeah, that's right. Anything of how the stars look? You might have seen this in a couple of JWS images. Yeah, the points on the stars, yeah, sparkly, twinkle. That's exactly, yeah, due to the mirror, yep, that's exactly what um, what you should be pointing out. So I'll talk about why a lot of these stars have these six points that you're noticing. Um, this is a star forming region that you're seeing here. So the way that you form stars is a little bit of gas, a little bit of dust, and a lot of gravity. And um, this is a region where, where stars are being born. How many of you have seen this image? Cool. So that's that uh, six points in the, in the star that you see, this background star next to Jupiter. Okay, how about this one? This was this was a, one of the most impressive ones. How many of you have seen this one? Okay. How many of you noticed this ring? What what do you think this ring is here? You're seeing sort of these distorted images um, of these, you know, these, these things look like kind of flattened pancakes. And I'm zooming in just to show you on the left of that. Gravity lensing, gravity distortion, okay. If you don't know what, what those terms are, if you're seeing if you're seeing the chat and don't recognize those terms, that's fine. I'll I'll talk about that, um, and I'll, I'll clarify what those means. Well, what those mean, but yeah, it's not they're not artifacts in the image. That's that's exactly what you're supposed to be seeing. So I know there were some questions 
um, seeing these curves saying, oh, is the mirror distorted? Is it, you know, not working properly? But no, that's, that's actually exactly what we should be seeing. Okay, so this whole talk really revolves around kind of that two sentence summary. And I'll break, break down each of these terms so that you understand at a, at a pretty fundamental level what it, what it means. So I'll begin even with, with just this phrase, the largest space-based telescope. What is a telescope? Why does it need to be large? And why does it need to be in space? So, so I'll answer these right now. Um, the first thing to start with is just what is light? So light, according to quantum mechanics, can be treated both as a wave and as a particle. And astronomers deal with light both as a wave and as a particle, depending on what type of, what type of light they're looking at. So a radio astronomer thinks of light as a wave. Um, an optical astronomer might think of it more as a particle. But it doesn't matter. As astronomers, we just want to collect more of it. And to collect more of it, we use telescopes. Every telescope really has, if you break it down, only has two functions. It's supposed to collect light and focus light so that we can study it. And to collect the light, um, we need a large collecting area. So this schematic that you're seeing here um, is probably the most basic setup of, a, uh, um, of an optical telescope. And this, is, this looks very much like the home telescopes that you can buy for yourself. And it's composed of a primary mirror that's the most important light collecting device at the very back. So all the light comes in, hits that primary mirror, and then it reflects off of it, hits the secondary mirror, and then it goes into your into an eyepiece. So for for astronomers, we we don't use an eyepiece. We don't we don't look through telescopes like that anymore. Um, we then send it to a detector, and that detector then um, is powered by a by computation, and then we can we can analyze the data using using computers, which is a lot more efficient than trying to trying to do it by eye. So all that matters is for this primary mirror to be big. And that, that is actually, it just depends on the area. So if you have a bigger area, you'll just collect more light. And, and maybe some of you have seen some of these comparison images. Um, and uh, let's start with the image on the left. So you're seeing a person. Next to the person is the Hubble primary mirror. Remember, the primary mirror is the... Uh, is the main device that we care about here. And then you're seeing the, the James Webb Space Telescope primary mirror. That's six times bigger. So it's, it's, it's six times more light that you're collecting. Um, and just to get a sense of what, what that looks like comparing to, to real people, you're seeing an image on the, uh, on the right of, of some of the engineers in the, in the lab with the, with the mirror. So I see in the chat, it looks like a hive. So I'll answer that actually you know, in the next couple of slides, why, why it looks like that. Okay, so to, to answer sort of why James Webb looks at the wavelengths that it does, um, here you're seeing the electromagnetic spectrum. And what this is, it's just all the different types of light that exist. So I'm giving you on the, on the lower part of this diagram sort of references for the wavelengths of different types of light. And starting at the very left, you have light that is gamma rays, x-rays. You might have heard of ultraviolet rays come from the sun. They're dangerous to people if you stay in the sun too long. Um, at these, at these x-ray wavelengths um, and ultraviolet wavelengths, the light is basically the size of an atom, and smaller than that. It's very, very small wavelengths that as you extend to the, to the rainbow that you see there, that is then the that humans can see. So as you can tell it's a very, very narrow part of this electromagnetic spectrum. And if you see this brown, sort of those brown, um, they almost look like uh, like a canyon, like valleys that you're seeing here. That, that's the right way to think of them. So basically, the light tries to make its way to Earth, but the atmosphere acts like these big mountains in the way. And you might get a couple of valleys in between. So some of the visible light is indeed able to make its way through the Earth's atmosphere, make it to, to us so that we can see. Um, some of the near infrared light. So if you look a little bit to the right of that, some of that light also makes it down to Earth. And then see that big radio telescope in that huge valley, that huge sort of canyon right there. Radio light makes its makes its way to Earth. So um, what should be what be important here for you to notice is that uh, the visible light is still blocked a little bit by the Earth, and a lot of the near infrared light is blocked too. So. Ground-based telescopes will always be limited to some extent by 
by the amount of light that's able to make its way through the atmosphere. What also makes it difficult is that on Earth, uh, we have to deal with a lot of turbulence in the atmosphere. So that distorts images and makes it difficult to resolve things that are very far away or very faint. So this is our main motivation, really, for putting into telescopes into space to both overcome the effects of the atmosphere and to, um, to allow us to get more, more precision when studying the things that, that we want to study. So you can see here the wavelengths of light. So if you extend to the mid infrared, the wavelength is about the width of a human. And if you extend all the way far into the radio, um, the wavelengths of light really become the, the size of a football field. Okay, so I'm highlighting here in, or in yellow, the part of light that James Webb sees. So it very narrowly overlaps with what humans can see. So the reddest light that humans can see actually slightly overlaps with what James Webb can see. And it extends all the way through the near infrared, which has all these big nasty peaks that prevent us from getting really high quality um, near infrared light on Earth. We can get it, but it's um, it's ultimately limited by the atmosphere. And then it extends into a little bit into the mid infrared. So it's extending a little bit into this into these mountains that the block light that reaches Earth. It's a problem when it looks into the into the infrared. Because everything that has a temperature at the end of the day glows. How many of you have seen like night vision cameras? I don't know, some of these like police TV shows or, you know, or they like, spy shows, something like the image on the left. So just post on the chat if you've seen something like that, like night vision that relies on, on infrared cameras. Yeah. So so everything, everything that has temperature glows. And because JWST is trying to look at um, at things at those wavelengths, it's really got to block all the light. So James Webb has this very complicated sun shield mechanism um, um, that blocks a lot of the light from the sun, and also its components have to be cooled. Okay, so as interesting as it is to talk about sun shields and to talk about, you know, all the engineering parts of JWST and why why the mirror has to be so big, that's all very interesting. But uh, but let's go to some images. Let's let's start taking a dive into the science goals of, of this awesome telescope. Okay, so this is an image of the best mid infrared telescope that we had previously. So um, this is the Spitzer Space Telescope, actually run out of run out of Caltech. There's still the Spitzer Science Center next door to the Astronomy Building, where uh, where a lot of the mission operations took place. And this is an image of, uh, of the Large Magellanic Cloud. So this is really a, a small Milky Way. The Milky Way is our galaxy, but it has many satellite galaxies, including this Large Magellanic Cloud. You won't see it from the Northern Hemisphere, but you'll see it from the Southern Hemisphere. Can you see these dust filaments? So follow that lower arrow. Can you see sort of those filaments of dust at the very bottom of the image? Just post in the chat if you can see that or not. Post if you can see those dust filaments, or if you can see the small stars that the arrow is pointing to at the upper right. Can you see there's a kind of tricky? Is that a little bit blurry to see? Okay, people can kind of see it. I think I think you have pretty good eyesight. Um, I can see a cleanings in order. Yeah. So why don't you then look at what JWST you can see? So that's the same exact field. That's the same exact image um, with the resolution power of JWST. So all of these dust filaments immediately become a lot more clear. A lot of the stars at the upper right finally come through. Um, and yeah, let me just show this you know, side to side. And what I'm showing you here is also sort of the history of, of, um, of previous telescopes. So if there's one trend that you can see, it's just that the mirrors get bigger. So in, in the 80s, we, we dealt with things that were less than, a, less than a meter in aperture. Aperture just means the diameter of the telescope. Um, Spitzer still was less than, a, less than a meter. The Herschel Space Observatory was 3.5 meters, and then James Webb now with its 6.5 meter aperture is the, is the biggest we've had. So really side to side, I think, is the best way to compare these images and really appreciate how much better James, uh, James Webb is going to be able to do compared to previous ones. Okay, so what I'm showing you here now is um, a galaxy cluster. This MAX 0723 galaxy cluster um, is amongst one of the largest structures in the universe. These galaxy clusters are all bound, and in particular, they're bound by, by a lot of dark matter. 
And what this dark matter does is that it's so heavy that it's able to bend light. That's basically what Einstein said. Anything that has any mass is able to bend light and change the fabric of space-time. So um, that's how you get these distorted images because light that originates from behind these very big galaxy clusters must pass somehow through these clusters and make its way to Earth. So when there's a lot of mass in the way, it'll take the shortest path and go around. So, so that's why you get, like, if you see at the, at the bottom, I don't know if you're able to make out that small sort of uh, squiggly line that you see on top of the, uh, on top of that point of light. And that squiggly line is exactly this, this bending due to, due to the dark matter. So this is, this is what we had with, with Hubble and Hubble's still in space. Hubble's still a very reliable instrument, still very, very good. Um, and it can see at wavelengths that James Webb can't. Um, but um, nevertheless, it's still it's still limited by, by how powerful it can be. And here's what James Webb has to say about that. That's the same image. That's the same same um, feel that you're looking at. Same galaxy cluster, but uh, but that's James Webb. So here you can see all of the all of these uh, um, gravitational lensing um, features come out a lot more clearly. So here's the one that I'm highlighting, and it's for the same two stars, you can see that that squiggly line a lot more clearly. And just side to side, James Webb versus versus Hubble. It's really, really a dramatic difference, and it's really going to add a lot to, to what we can see. Simply because if you, I mean, you can just look at it by eye. If you look on the right at Hubble, there's a lot of stars, a lot of small points that you just can't resolve. Those are actually all galaxies. And you really can't see those, or, sorry, you can't see those in Hubble, but in James Webb, they come through really, really well. Yeah, so I'll just give you a moment to sort of pick out things that you notice in James Webb that you couldn't see in Hubble before and, uh, and make that comparison. Cool. So there is this question of... Um, Aren't these just false color images? Like, are we are we being lied to? Are these, you know, um, are these real or not? And we need to go back to the electromagnetic spectrum. So remember, human eyes can't see everything. Um, human eyes can only see a very, very narrow portion of it. And if you recall that yellow part that I highlighted, James Webb sees well outside what human eyes can see. And you're seeing at near-infrared wavelengths, this image on the right, um, and you're seeing, it just looks normal. It just looks like a normal star field and you're seeing points of light there and, you know, there's, there's nothing remarkable about it. But as you move closer to wavelengths that the human eye can't see, you'll see this very, very big cloud. So actually, if you point at this star field with a normal telescope, you'll see this really big cloud in the way. You'll think that there's just this part of space that's empty. I think there's like a lot of conspiracy theory websites, you know, saying, oh yeah, you know, there's this big you know, patch of patch of sky that's uh, that's dark, and we're being lied to with false color images. You know that actually show that it's not. Um, it's just because human eyes can't see through that cloud, and that's actually very similar to that star forming cloud that I showed you um, an image of through James Webb at the start of this talk. And um, it's got a lot of dust in the way. So what that dust does is in the same way when there's a uh, a wildfire. Um, I don't know if any. Of, any of you in the audience are in, a, are in California and have experienced the wildfire season. But when there's a lot of dust, when there's a lot of sort of smoke and soot in the air, you'll see everything gets a little bit redder. When things get redder, um, if they get too red, like they will from this, from this uh, star-forming region or this dark cloud in, in space, um, then you just can't see it. So that's exactly what's happening here. And if you look at redder wavelengths, it looks normal. And you can see through it and all the stars, all the stars shine through So what we have to do is we just have to, when we show these images um, on the news or in any press release or even when we analyze them, we just have to pick colors. We can't pick the same colors that human eyes could see or else we just wouldn't see anything. So we can assign colors really anywhere we want. And I'm showing you again a, small, a smaller snippet of the electromagnetic spectrum here on the right. And um, the limit of human eyes is that black line. So basically all of these big filters that James Webb can see in are outside of the, the range of human eyes. So what we do is we pick from short wavelength to longer wavelength 
roughly um, the same color as the rainbow. Blue, green, yellow, orange, red, just so we can make sense of these images. And these are, it's true, these are sort of arbitrarily picked. They're also picked, you know, just due to how easy it is to manufacture certain filters and um, or maybe what highlight, what features you want to highlight. You can actually see at the bottom of this some narrower filters. And these are certain parts that we're really interested in seeing um, for the electromagnetic spectrum. And I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you in a little bit why those small narrow bands can be, can be very useful to us. So they are false color images, but we're not trying to lie to you. We're just trying to be able to show you anything at all. Okay, and why do we keep seeing this honeycomb? So this, this goes back a little bit to the engineering for, for JWST. And because it's so big a telescope, it actually had to be sent up into space folded. It had to be sent up folded, and then it had to unfold in space. So what you had to do is deconstruct the mirror and make it so it can fold in and fold back out. If you try to pack a lot of small circles together, you'll have gaps. And as astronomers, remember, we want to collect all the light that we possibly can. So we want to pack mirrors as tightly as we can. And this, this little schematic on the right should illustrate that hexagons are a lot better at doing that compared to, uh, compared to circles. The gold plating is um, not because we want to show off all our bling to aliens in space. We're not, we're not in the business of, uh, of doing that. Um, we have this gold plating because it's highly reflective. So remember, this, this primary mirror is only the first part of the puzzle in getting the light focused and usable for, uh, for astronomers to look at. So what we want to do is have as, as little light lost to the mirror as possible, making it highly reflective with this gold plating. It's the, it's the best way to accomplish that. And why do we see these spikes? So these spikes primarily are due to the mirror shape. They're primarily due to this honeycomb structure. That's why you see these six main spikes. You'll also see some of these smaller spikes. Some of the smaller ones might overlap with the bigger ones, um, but there's also two little spikes off to the left and right that don't overlap. And those are due to the support. So a little bit of the light did have to be blocked, and that's just to support the secondary mirror. If you recall from that schematic of the of the telescope earlier, you remember that there had to be a secondary mirror or else you just lose all the light back to space. So that secondary mirror gets in the way, the support beam that, that supports it, and that leads to some of these spikes. And if you see that sort of that model construction, that, that prediction from the, from the things that we, uh, we think cause these spikes, um, that, that's exactly what you see. So this was the first uh, evaluation image, I think, shown to the, shown to the public. And it's exactly those six spikes with those uh, two small ones to the left and right. Okay, and those spikes are due to something called diffraction. And diffraction is um, something that we see in everyday life. So um, my generation is probably the last that knows what DVDs are and CDs are. I think kids younger than me don't, don't know what those are. So the way that you encode data onto CDs and DVDs, if any of you have picked up a CD or a DVD, how many of you have seen this rainbow? Just put this in the chat if you've seen this rainbow, if you look at it. Yeah, good. So that's, yep, that's, that's um, because it's got all of these sort of little, little holes in it. Um, and those, what, what happens is that light from the sun or from a lamp or whatever you have, it reflects off of it but it also gets split, these, these little gratings, what they're able to do is they're able to split the light into its constituent wavelengths. And in doing so, we were able to much more clearly define, okay, here's blue light, here's yellow light, orange light, red light, and um, we're able to split light apart. So um, if you're just looking at a CD or DVD, it just looks cool, it just looks interesting, um, but this is probably the most valuable thing for scientists. And <clears throat> sort of the secret that I'll let you in on right now, and that you can all keep, is that the public will only keep seeing images from JWST on, um, on the news, but scientists will see something very different. Scientists will see something called spectra. So this is exactly the, the same thing that I'm showing you um, what, what CDs and DVDs do. So there's this diffraction grating, which behaves very much in the, in the same way. And this diffraction grating, again, what you're seeing in this schematic is a white light comes in, and then this grating splits it apart into light that goes all the way from blue to red. And that's what scientists read in, these detectors, and James Webb has a ton of these. Okay, 
So if there's something that you take away from what Spectra is, is it's, it's quantum mechanical fingerprints. So different elements, different elements in the periodic table, maybe you've heard of hydrogen, helium, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, all things that play a big role in, in everyday life. Um, sodium, chlorine, you know, and NaCl, that's just salt. H2O, that's, that's water. Water is made up of, uh, of hydrogen and oxygen. All of these very basic fundamental building blocks of, of our everyday world, um, they have fingerprints according to quantum mechanics, and they're unique. So not only that, but different physical processes, different things that are occurring in space can change these fingerprints, or they can give us different fingerprints. And a lot of people ask, this is the question that I get the most when I tell people that, that I'm studying um, astrophysics is, how do we actually know what's happening far away? How do we actually know what's happening in places that we'll never be able to reach? And that's, that's due to quantum mechanics. That's due to these fingerprints that we see from these very distant, um, these very distant systems, these very distant worlds. But because we see these lines, because we see these certain colors, these are very discrete lines, um, what you're seeing in the schematic here is helium. If you, if you have a pure helium gas, um, you'll be able to see lines at exactly this blue one, at exactly that yellow one, at exactly that red one. The lines of oxygen, the fingerprint of oxygen looks a little bit different. The fingerprint of neon looks a little bit different. If you're looking at some random thing, which is the mixture above, you can then decompose it. And you can say, okay, cool, that's made up of all of these elements. We have these tables. We have all of these places where... Um, or do we expect to see these lines? And you might think, wow, quantum mechanics is, is so mysterious. You know, it gives us all of these lines. But you can actually solve it. You can actually solve it by just saying, okay, the structure of an atom, you can start with hydrogen and say it's just a, pro it's a proton and an electron revolving around it. And you can calculate where you expect to see these lines. You can then carry out a much more complex calculation for all these bigger elements, and you'll see that you get exactly those results. So that's how we know what's going on in space, and that's what's important for, for us scientists to see. So how many of you have seen this image from JWST in space? Or, sorry, on the, on the news. Maybe not that many of you have seen it, so please post on the chat if any of you have seen this. Yeah, a couple of yes, a couple of no. Good. Okay. So what you're seeing here is these very weird squiggly lines. You're seeing these white points and there's a line that sort of fits to them. And you're seeing spectra. You're seeing the same images as the ones that I showed you before. And all of these bumps are actually due to water. So water molecules, they, they also have their own fingerprints because that's composed of H2O. Um, and what you're seeing here is the spectrum of a, of a planet very similar to Jupiter. Jupiter is a planet known as a gas giant. But this, we're not looking at Jupiter. We're looking at water in the atmosphere of a planet very far away. So what happens is that the light that originates from its star, from its host star, then passes through the planet when the planet, when the planet goes in front of the star, and then it's modified because it has to pass through the atmosphere of the planet. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Um, we're seeing signatures of water in, a, in the atmospheres of planets very far away. So all, the, all these little bumps look super boring, but they're the most exciting thing for, for scientists to see. Because again, these are the, the fingerprints that tell us exactly what's going on so far away. Um, maybe some of you have seen this image. Um, this, this came out of work done um, primarily here at, at Caltech a while ago, and this is using space-based telescopes. But um, in, its, uh, in its science, in the sort of scientific term, um, this device is called a coronagraph. It's not at all related to the coronavirus. Um, but what this coronagraph does is it blocks out light from stars. Because stars are very bright, and if they have planets going around them, the planets are very dim. So what you're seeing here is you block the light of the star, and then you're able to resolve the planets that orbit that star. And this was actually a, a movie that you can see of the, of the planets going around it. So JWST will do exactly this. It has these coronagraphs that will block some of the light from, from stars so that we can actually see the planets going around them. And, and okay, there's, a, there's already really interesting science um, or scientific claims at least so far coming out of, uh, coming out of JWST. So this is, this is just an update on, on science news. There's a website called, called the Archive and, uh, and scientists can, uh, 
can go through can go through this and sort of interpret early early results. Okay, so this came out I think two weeks ago at this point, and this this isn't peer reviewed yet. You know, these are just some some claims so far. But JWST can see the most distant galaxies, and what is shown here is images taken from different filters in JWST. Remember that I showed you it, it can have different uh, different filters here, and if you don't know what Z of something is, that's totally fine. I'm giving you a reference here. If Z is equal to five, the universe, um, this means that, that the galaxy is, uh, is 12 billion years old compared to us. Z equals 17, that's over 13 billion years old. Our universe is about 13.7 billion years. So these scientists are doing this in this very early publication is, is that they're saying, okay, we're identifying some galaxy here. It might be 12 billion years old, it might be 13. Um, it's, it's unclear exactly what, what it is so far, but the point is that JWST is already looking at things very, very far into the past, very, very early into the, into the universe's formation. This one I thought was really impressive too. So this is, this is taking apart some of the JWST images. And remember that I said that, uh, this, this lensing can, uh, can amplify images, um, that, that come, it can amplify things that come from behind something very massive. So what's, what people are thinking they're seeing here is in these filaments and these things that are being, being magnified, you can see a couple of stars within them. So stars, stars are often in clusters. And what's, what's thought that's being shown here is these stars and clusters are being, are being lensed toward us. So we can, they're being magnified for us. We can see them better, but they're actually really, really far away. They're actually far behind the, uh, the foreground of the image here. So these, these particular ones are thought to be about over 7 billion years old. Again, these are early results. It's not, they're not all peer reviewed just yet, but people really think that uh, JWST is, is indeed able to, to deliver and to show some of the farthest, most, um, uh, most newly formed things in the, in the universe. And, um, and this is the newest image. So this, this one was, uh, was put out, and this is the, the cartwheel galaxy is what it was called. So the universe is actually not, not a quiet, tranquil place. It's actually constantly evolving and very active. And galaxies can collide. So what you're seeing in this image is the result of one of these collisions, and you're seeing rings of gas sort of rush outward, very much like shock waves coming from this, uh, coming from this galaxy, and that's, that's this, this cartwheel galaxy. Cool. Um, and that's that's my last slide. Um, happy to happy to sort of you know take any questions or, or answer anything for the next you know five to ten minutes. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. I'm gonna meet you right now and turn it back over to turn it back over to George. happy to take any questions so we'll please post them in the local chat and we'll go in order so let's start with max's question how old is the cartwheel yeah. okay test test coming through yeah okay. uh, i'm not sure how old the cartwheel is It's relatively nearby galaxy as such things go. So it's probably seen well, some millions of light years away. But it's today as old as the Milky Way. Yeah, just a quick Google search telling me it's about 500 million light years away. Yeah, okay. Let me go ahead and read some of these. Okay, sorry, I'm just going to keep going in order. Um, can we see past the particle horizon, or will be ever will we be ever able to see past it? Will the size of the observable universe change, or will it remain the same regardless of advancements of any kind of technology? So there's a, there's a limit to how far we can see, and we already have telescopes that can that can see that far. Um, that's known as the the cosmic microwave background. 
So at that point, that was the first point where light could actually escape because the, the universe prior to that was so dense that the light could not make its way out. So that's, that's actually the oldest surface that we can see in the universe. And we actually already have telescopes that can see that far. After that, there was a, a big point where the universe was just very dark again, and then we couldn't see anything. Um, then between that last surface and when we can start to see stars and galaxies form, that, that's all a very, very mysterious era. And that's, that's part of the era that James W., um, that the J, JWST is going to be seeing. Okay, I read that the JW telescope experienced more objects hitting it in L2 than expected. Is this potentially going to be a problem? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so L2 means that it's a point very far away from, uh, from Earth. It's much farther than Hubble was. So the reason that it's so far out there, again, is to, um, to reduce a lot, of the, a lot of the thermal light that can be seen from Earth and to just get it into a very stable orbit over there. And yeah, there were some things that have been hitting it over there, just small space debris. Um, and it's, it's fine. Like the telescope is okay. It didn't, it didn't damage it in any way. But yeah, the tricky thing about sending it that far away is that we can't repair it. So Hubble was repaired because it had an infamous problem in mirror early on, but you could just send up astronauts in the space shuttle to, to do that fix. Uh, JWST is not like that. We can't just send people all the way out there. So um, it's, a, it's a potential problem, but it's, it's been okay so far. I, I think enough calculations were done to make sure that the risk of something major hitting it was, uh, was low enough. Okay, question. You showed me the spectrum of water on exo, exoplanets, not exoskeletons. I'll clarify that. Um, can you distinguish ice from liquid water with the spectra? Uh, I don't. I don't think you can see ice so that the chemical composition is the same so based on that alone you can't see any difference the only way that it would be different is that if the ice maybe is reflecting a lot of the light of the of the star that it's going around that's the only thing that i that i'd say um could be a giveaway of ice versus water but from the spectra alone i i, I don't think there's a noticeable difference Exoplanets, I meant. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Are there plans to launch more telescopes like JWST in the future? Yeah. Yeah. So there's already already plans in place for uh, for the next suite of uh, of telescopes launched by by NASA, and a lot of them are also in in collaboration with the European Space Agency. Um, I think the the general goal. So the, there's goals that are outlined roughly every ten years in what's called a, a decadal survey. And one of, the, one of the big things that came out of the most recent one is that we want to move away from these really, really big projects like James WST was. Um, I keep saying James WST. JWST was and, uh, and move toward more modest-sized telescopes um, to sort of diversify the, the science goals a little bit. But, uh, but yeah, there's, there's still a lot of them out there. Fingers crossed that it survives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much data do we have to look at and what kind of machine learning algorithms are being utilized to answer questions regarding possibilities of life on planets across the universe? I'd say the James WST is still a more old-fashioned telescope in the sense that you tell it what to look at and then it goes and points and looks at that. So I don't think James WS, uh, JWST is going to run into this issue of having a ton of data. Like it does have a lot of data and on the individual images that are released, you can do a lot of algorithms and you can, you know, extract as much information as you can, but it's very different from other telescopes, both in space and on Earth, that their goal is very different from James James, um, James Webb. You don't give them a target to look at. You don't tell them some place to point to. You instead say, look at the whole sky, give me an image of the whole sky every two nights. One of the, the, the main telescope I use here at Caltech, actually, for my science is called the, the Zwicky Transient Facility. And that scans the sky every two days. So those telescopes have a really, really impressive amount of information um, to the point where they look at, bit, they've amassed points for billions of stars and billions of things in, in space. So sifting through billions of points, yeah, that then, that then requires machine learning algorithms. And it depends what you're trying to do. So if you just want to look at numbers, you use what's called regression techniques. If you want to sort of categorize the things that you're looking at, you then use 
machine learning to, to categorize and you use classifiers. You use things like like random forests, then put it into its own into its own categories. Um, but I think I think James Webb is still in a in a little bit more fashioned um, sense where you tell it what to look at. Um, I read that lenses produced for the JW telescope were highly specialized, large, expensive. How sensitive are those lenses? And if it's hit by debris, what concern do you have with lens damage? Um, yeah, they were they were very new. Um, they were beryllium detectors, so it had to be a little bit different than than previous telescopes. Um, I guess it just depends on type of debris that hits it. If it's just something small, it sort of hits the edge, then it'll be okay. But if it's something major that tears a big hole through it, the, the biggest concern might not be what happens to the lenses, but what happens to the, to the telescope itself. You mentioned it uses the detector. What, what is the name of the detector, please? There's a lot of different detectors on James Webb. And uh, you can look at the website. You can look at the official website and see what some of these are. So some of these are for purely imaging. One of those is called NERCAM. Let me post it in the chat. There's NERCAM. Um, there's also some that do spectroscopy. That's adequately named NERSPEC. Um, NIR means near infrared. And, and there's another detector, for example, called MIRI. That stands for mid infrared. That's actually mid infrared infrared instrument. Here. So, so there's a lot of these on on James Webb. I think there's like five or six major ones. Um, and yeah, those all those all have different different science goals. Some of these have the uh, have the coronagraph built in too. I thought telescopes use a magnifying lens, but you talked about the mirror. Does the, mag does the mirror magnify it as well as focus? Yeah. So, okay. Um, you might be thinking about telescopes that are, there's a difference between refracting and reflecting telescopes. So a lot of, a lot of amateur telescopes that you can buy at a, at a store, those are, you know, things you can have in your backyard. Those use lenses. Those indeed use lenses to uh, to focus the light and to to magnify it, um, and uh, that that's different from the telescopes that are that are reflecting. So all of the all of the big scientific telescopes nowadays are, are reflecting telescopes, and it's simply because lenses are very difficult, very big to build, um, and then they also lead to uh, degradation of the image because it's a uh, because it's a lens. So if something happens with uh, with the wavelengths that things to the edge appear redder, bluer. Um, lenses can sag. They get very big. They're actually they're they're very clumsy to work with. So, um, so that's why we use mirrors actually. And those those can then do the they can both uh, collect the light and then focus the light. Okay, um, I, I can answer maybe one more of these. But if there's uh, if there's anyone who hasn't asked a question so far that'd like to ask one, you know, please please post it in the chat. Oh, cool! Today's live should be available somewhere. Nice. Um, okay, I'll take I'll take uh, this this uh, this next question here. This is related to lensing more than James Webb, since collections of galaxies create lensing. It also follows when assumes the whole universe also creates a giant space and gravity well because of its colossal mass. As the universe expands, the gravity well could lessen and space time flattens or recovers. Could this possibly explain why galaxies appear to speed up as they get more distant and the universe gravity lessens? So what do you think? I've gone off and misunderstood space time. So the 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 short answer I think is no. I, this this isn't isn't related at all. And um, the thing is that the first thing I'd say is probably the gravity. Well, it, it has to be very dense and it has to be packed very closely together. So I think the universe as a, as a whole isn't packed close enough together for it to, to have any appreciable lensing anywhere. Or else we'd, everywhere we'd look, we'd see some sort of lensing. So I think I think that's not not quite the right way to think about it. Um, any final questions? Any anything else in the in the chat? You know, feel free to feel free to send an email or a, a reach out anyway afterward.
Okay, well, thank you so much. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it back to uh, turn it back to George real quick. Well, thank you, Tony, and thank you all for coming, and and thank, thank you for all of your questions. Well, that concludes things, and hopefully we'll see you okay, here again in some other presentations. Back.